Good evening, Internet, and welcome to Camera Dads episode number nine. I am Phil Ringsmith, and with me, as always, is my co-host and brother, Mr. Simon Ringsmith. How are you doing, Simon? Good evening, Phil, brother, co-host, and fellow camera dad. That's right. And it, it occurred to me that for new, they might not know what this show is about, so Camera Dads is a show where Phil and I, who are fathers, talk about photography. So there you go. And uh, what is our? Yeah, we, we what's our uh, topic every time, and, and just kind of uh, talk about how how we uh, enjoy or handle whatever that may be. So tonight we're talking about what has been sort of a hobby for both of us for a long time, and that is macro photography. Now, I first thought you might think that macro photography doesn't necessarily have anything to do with being a camera dad. And you know, <laughs> if you thought that you might be kids. right. <laughs> I'm going to try to prove them wrong. Okay. I have, I am going to try to prove that wrong a little bit, at least. Uh, I hope. <laughs> if anyone so, can do it, it's um, you, Phil. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about Simon, about what is macro photography for people who may not have heard this term before? Yeah. So I think there might be a little bit of misconception about mac macro photography. It simply means looking at things really close. And if you if you look at the the word in general, it just means a close up view of something. So um, in photography terms, that means getting close, really close. Typically, you do this with a macro lens, which costs several hundred dollars. But uh, if you've ever seen a photo in National Geographic where you have like a an ant that is so detailed and, and life size almost, or there's um, like a snowflake where you can see all the individual little uh, lattices and everything and stuff like that's macro, that's getting really close. And for me, it's more of just something I do for fun as uh, an artistic expression kind of thing. And for Phil, as, as we'll find out, as I'm going to find out here, it's uh, he combines macro and kid photography, uh, taking pictures of the kids. So that that's really what macro is. Anytime you hear someone talking about it, you don't necessarily need expensive equipment, and we'll get into that, but it just means getting really close to something. And if I can get a little technical, it means there's a one-to-one -one ratio of the size of the object to the size of your camera sensor. So most camera sensors are about the size of a postage stamp. If you're taking, taking a picture of a dime, imagine that dime sitting on top of your camera sensor, which means the picture of the dime when you open it up on your camera would literally fill your entire picture because you that to look at this on a monitor or a poster the single image the dime the ant the grasshopper is the entire photo yeah exactly and that's closer than what I tend to think of about, about macro is you get to see a lot of details in things that you can't really see with your naked eye. I mean, you can probably see them yeah. with a magnifying glass, you know. Um, we're not talking about um, microscopic photography, you know, things where you would have to get a microscope and look at, you know, leaf cell structures and mm -hmm. things like that. That That is completely different. Yeah, that's we're a little too about, macro. Yeah. <laughs> This is more about just, for me, it's about taking things that I would see in everyday life and just looking at them in an extremely close and seeing what kind of details are there that you wouldn't normally be able to see. It's like, oh, that's really cool. Just something like, uh, even just something like printed words on a page. If you yeah, get close yeah. enough. You see all the um, little... Like you can see the ink fibers of the page. Yeah, you can see the mm -hmm. ink bleeding away from the letters, and I, I find that stuff very interesting. So that's yeah. what that's what kind of gets me on it. Is one of those just all of that detail that's right in front of you, but you just can't see it. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, I when I started getting into macro, which was much after Phil did, um, or or you did, Phil. <laughs> um, I I would take my my macro gear and look at uh, forks in the, dish, in, in the dish drying rack or um, leaves on, on the trees outside. I mean, just anything around me. And I found so much uh, intricacies and, and beauty in these really mundane things. So it was really cool to, to start exploring that. 
I found out when I was going back and looking at this, this was kind of, this was, this was my idea to, to have this show because I've been interested in macro photography for, for, it seemed like a long time. Yeah, and you really have. We talked about before how I had one of the very earliest digital cameras and I went back and looked, I found a couple of, uh, attempts at macro photography from 1999. Are you serious? Clear back then? Yes. I have two Ooh, pictures oh. that I can bring up that. Uh, oh yeah, that's they, awesome. They're, they're not good, but, um, and, oh man, are they tiny? Like <laughs> that was your, your one megapixel camera, wasn't it? Yes. This is my one megapixel camera, but these photos, uh, these two are, I don't know, 640 by 480. Yeah, that, I never that's a took, megapixel. I never took photos at, at one megapixel back then because I didn't have the storage for it. So let me bring this up. <laughs> and Phil's doing a window. screen sharing here. If you're listening to the podcast, you might have to go to uh, YouTube to see this feed here. Um, but wow, what is this, Phil? I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention that if um, I would like to try to share my own photos a little bit more on, on camera dads uh, when it's appropriate. And so this show in particular, I've got a lot of things to show. It's, you can check them out in two ways. If you watch the video of the episode uh, it, um, on YouTube, just search for camera dads or uh, all of the pictures that I have here will be posted on our Facebook page too. So if you just go to facebook.com and search for camera dads, you can find them there. So this first awesome. picture, honestly, I'm not sure what it is. It yeah. is, it, it appears to be a rope tied around a tree root. Yeah, it's interesting, whatever uh, it is. Surrounded by some grass and sand. I don't, I can't really say anything more than that, but this was, gosh, I was. Maybe you'd 17. have been like 17 years old. Yeah. And and you can tell that it's in 1999 because back then, <laughs> the date did you, on yeah, it. the date stamped in the quarter. <laughs> So I, I, I don't know what this was, but it shows that I've been interested in this for as long as I've had a digital That's camera. Cool, That's really uh, cool. And I've got one more here. This one um, you can tell is a a hinge latch of some kind. There's a uh, there's a padlock and a little a latch. Oh, the padlock is you can. It's, Phil, you can I know what this really is. washed out because there's there's a flash, <laughs> which Phil, I, I know use all the time. Is. This uh, is, but this is, go ahead. Th this is uh, when they invited you to uh, Isla Nublar to put locking mechanisms on the vehicle doors. Yeah, because and they didn't have locking mechanisms they, on the vehicle doors. So yeah. I, took, I took my DC 100 down there mm -hmm. and uh, boy, I'm glad I made it out. Yeah, you barely made it out. So that's what this is. It's a locking mechanism, probably on a vehicle oh, door oh. is what I'm guessing. Yeah, probably. So I, I wanted to bring these up just because I thought it was cool that I was able to go back and, uh, and find them from so long ago. That is cool. I didn't realize that you'd had an interest that long ago and yeah. you can prove it. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's kind of cool. So, so, so Phil, you've been, uh, you've been in, enjoying this for a while. What, what have you done over the years since those early days with the lock and that rope thing? How, how have you explored this over the years? One thing that I have really, <laughs> wanted to be able to do with macro um is get better photos get tack sharp photos of something so so close up and just have it look like they look you know in the magazines or from national geographic mm -hmm. and i mentioned earlier that i do try to to have my kids involved because i think there's there's so much detail in things right under our noses that they just, you don't even know it's there. And if I can capture that and just get the kids interested, say, look at this bug. You think it looks cool because it's a ladybug or, or something. Well, look what happens when we get this close to it. You can see, look at the way the wings open up. I mean, a, a, I just oh. kind of guessed a ladybug, but a ladybug yeah, yeah, actually yeah. has an outer shell that opens up and then underneath it are these super, super thin black sort of translucent wings, which fold up and open up really wide. You never, ever see that, you know, to a kid, a ladybug is just 
this little cute thing that crawls on their finger. But if you're able to, to somehow capture that, you can show videos. I mean, I'm just not saying you can't go online and look for you right, know, right, right. Videos. But it's cool to see it, that, that ladybug in your own backyard. See yeah, it really up close. Um, I have one here that I'll bring up, and these are. This is an example of actually mixing the macro photography with the kids directly, and you'll see what I mean here. Uh, once I get it shown, and oh my goodness, Phil. So why don't, why don't you why don't you describe what what we're so looking what, at? So what we're seeing here is it's a ladybug on someone's hand and it's super close up. So you can you can see the all the little folds in the skin and and every little dot on the ladybug and it, it, at the end of there, the there the ladybug's legs you can see individual feet. This is really close. This is And this as we're going to show, when, when you talked about sharing uh, macro photography with your kids, I've been thinking about it this whole time as pictures of your kids close up. Mm -hmm. I haven't really considered what you're talking about, where you're involving them in the, the act of making macro photos. And that's a cool way to explore it. I don't know that I've thought about it that way before. Well, thank you. That, I think that that's, I, I, I don't know where it comes from but I just have these visions of what I want a picture to be. And when I have, the, you know, when the kids are playing in the backyard, just every day, you know, mundane stuff, mm -hmm. you find a bug and I think, okay, if I could just get a picture of this bug on the, on the kid's finger. Yeah. Cause it'll hold every context. Cause anyone yeah. can see a picture of a bug. Oh, I just, <laughs> that's a big deal. Just go it online. But now that's a picture of a ladybug in your son's hand, and that gives it a whole different meaning. And the, yeah. the backstory to that then is your your son and your daughter are engaging in this process with you. And then you look at the photo, and then they remember, oh yeah, that's that time we did this thing. So it's way more than just a picture of a ladybug on a leaf, and that's really cool. Uh, I would I would love to be that National Geographic photographer who, you know, can go out with thousands of dollars of equipment and get incredible macro pictures of insects as a hobby. Mm -hmm. But that's got nothing to do with my kids and my family. Yeah, yeah. That's and, just, that would just be for me. You know, I, it, and it, there's a difference there. It's not really as meaningful. I mean, we've talked before about the pictures that really mean something to us and tell a story. And essentially, you're you're your involvement of your kids in this particular type of art that you like to make means each picture has more of a story behind it. And you know, that's kind of a recurring theme that we, that we have here on the show is finding a way to, to, to create a context for what we're talking about. And in terms of photography, there's a lot of parents out there who really want to in, marry the photography with their family. And I think a lot of people are, are coming at this from my mindset of that must mean take pictures of my kids. It doesn't have to be like that. What you're saying is just involve your kids in the art and in that process. And I think that's a really, really good uh, angle to take on all this. Thank you. I do want to ask you though, you mentioned that uh, National Geographic photographers and thousands of dollars worth of stuff. Um, it, as, as you do macro photography and as clearly you've been doing it for almost two decades, or at least interested in it. What do you need to do this sort of thing? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, originally, I was just hoping that I could do it with the camera that I had. And as we saw from those first couple of photos, that's just not, that wasn't possible. Uh, now, today, a lot of cameras off the shelf, and cell phones even, are able to focus on an object very, very close. So you can mm -hmm. focus on something within an inch or maybe even a centimeter. If, gosh, you don't even have to spend very much money. Your cell phone might be able to do it. It might have a mode that you can put it in that does like a, a close focus mode. Maybe it's even called macro. Um, but the one thing that you can do is you and I have a cousin who is 
she does a ton of macro photography of flowers and insects. And she does oh, it all yeah. with her iPhone. She, I'm and sorry, what? She does it all with her iPhone. And a little $40, $50 accessory called an Olo clip. Oh, yeah, that thing's awesome. <laughs> and when I used when I, when these things first came out, I was like, "Yeah, that's junk. That's never going to work." Yeah, well, I thought the same thing. They've they've obviously gotten a lot better over the years. But you can spend forty, fifty bucks, and or a couple hundred bucks if you really, really want to get a good one. But it's just a little clip that goes on the corner of your phone and sits exactly on top of the camera lens and lets you get these really really nice macro shots. And that can yeah. be done, you know. Matter of fact, you don't need a DSLR or anything for that. Um, that's, if that's anyone not, knows. personally, that's not what I have because I use my camera and I use uh, something called the close up filters, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I used to try to use my cell phone to take uh, to take macro shots. Actually, I had one come up today. I wonder if I can find it. Um, I was outside um, climbing up the treehouse and I saw this bug. Hope you wore like, your well, safety shoot. gear. What did I? I did not wear my safety gear. Oh, Phil. So uh, let me see here. I haven't actually looked at these. <laughs> so. While you're and, pulling that up, I just want to quickly plug um, our cousin Beth. If you go to Instagram.com slash Beth rings, as in like Beth rings your doorbell, uh, Instagram.com slash Beth rings, you'll see uh, a ton of her macro photography examples and all of these, she just uses, uh, like you said, Phil, a, a forty-dollar clip. It's not fancy, and she just has, a, I think, an iPhone five S. So it's not even, from what I understand, unless you got a new one, it's not even like super current phone. And my goodness, you would think these are magazine level quality, and I'm, they are magazine level quality. But she didn't are, spend yeah. five thousand dollars. She just spent forty bucks on a little clip. So check that out. Man, yeah, yeah. I'll go ahead and bring this one up. This was, um, this was just happened to be today. I don't know what this was, but being me, I was just got. Oops, yes, I up there. It's just I've got seen crazy those in my yard too. <laughs> my wife listens to the show, but uh, she'll know. I was supposed to be watching the baby, who was up in a treehouse just in front of me, and I got distracted <laughs> climbing up after her with <laughs> this bug that I saw. And you can uh, tell how close that is if you're um, if you're looking at this video or if you're looking at this this picture, it's this this bug. Um, I used to know what that was called. One of my coworkers told me, and it's on the edge of a board, and you can you can see that this it's not a very large board. It's probably a a, a, a four inches by four inches, maybe or maybe it's a two by four. Yeah, it's, I and think you, it's a two by four, but you can see how close you were to this thing. And here's the whole thing. There's, I mean, I oh, yeah, a sure. couple inches away. This is, and, it, and that's, for those of you listening, it looks like kind of a, a, a beetle. Um, and it's got, I don't know, it's probably about three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch long front to back. Would you say, Phil? Yeah. And it's got these strange sort of antennas with big leaves, like leafy ears on the end. Yeah. And that's why I stopped. I'm like, what is going on here? I've never seen this before. But if you, again, like I said, if you're listening, uh, you can find them later on Facebook, uh, or uh, yeah, if you want to watch the watch the webcast, go on mm -hmm. YouTube and find it there. And I like the context for this photo. It's not just a bug; it's a bug really close. But then you can see uh, the the playhouse behind it, and so you you've now told a story, and that's something that. Um, as if someone out there is, is trying to figure out a way to get more involved in doing this sort of thing, whether it's macro or not, if you can tell a story about one of your photos, it's going to be a lot more impactful to you. And so here you've just told a story about how you're climbing up and supposed to be watching the baby and all this. And so there's all this context for what otherwise might be just a picture of a bug. And it's cool that you have such a close detailed view of that bug <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that is involved in all this. Well, that was th that was just taken with my phone, so nothing special. No kidding. Um, no kidding. Uh, and you don't have an auto clip on that phone, do you? No. See, that's the thing. I, I, I have a iPhone SE, so it's fairly current, uh, maybe a couple years old. 
And I forget that it can do this sort of thing. So I, I don't do it. And I think that's also a theme with some, uh, some, some casual photographers or maybe uh, parents who want to do more photography is uh, the, the camera you already have in your phone can actually do a lot that you might not realize. So even without a, uh, an accessory, you got that really cool photo of that, that really close up of a bug. I'm gonna go try that next time I'm, I'm walking around and, and wanna look up something up close. I'm gonna pull up my phone and see if I can do it. Cause now I've got a new way to explore this, this form of art that I didn't know about five yeah. minutes ago. I'm curious to see. I'm curious to see what you'd be able to do. Don't get your hopes up. Yeah, we'll see. So uh, <laughs> let's talk about, you asked about you know equipment. Um, I, I have almost zero special equipment for this. Uh, if I were really gonna get into it, I would save up and I would spend a couple hundred dollars on a good macro lens. Um, but because this is just sort of an interest and not a hobby, maybe, I just can't justify putting that kind of money into it. Yeah, exactly. But there's something that that you turned me on to that I had no idea existed. Uh, and it has to do with the filters that you can add to a lens. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what close up filters are? And I actually have my set right here for those that oh, are cool. watching. I'll, I'll show them. Yeah, that's great. How this works, um, but. So uh, on a on a standard DSLR camera, the front of your lens has thread screws in it and you can you can screw in they call them filters to the front of your lens. So you can screw in a filter, like a polarizing filter to take nature shots. You can screw in a, an ND filter to block out some sunlight. There's a lot of different filters. You can screw in an, uh, a, a, a curved piece of glass that allows your lens to focus on things that are really close. And then when that happens, you get a, a, a macro shot. And the, these filters aren't high tech. It's basically the same as an olive clip. It's an olive clip for your DSLR. And I've I've found out about these kind of by accident. <laughs> um, since Phil's been interested in macro photography for a while, it was maybe a year or two ago, I had about a $30 gift card to B&H Photo. And it was gonna expire at the end of like May or something. And so I went on B&H and I thought, what can I get for $30? Oh, a set of close-up filters. They're probably not gonna work, but it's $30 and I have to spend it or I lose it. So I bought them and oh my, it was awesome. Was, is, and continues to be awesome. These, these $30 pieces of glass you just screw onto your camera, suddenly you can do so much more with your lens and your camera than I, than I ever could before in terms of taking close-up photos. And you've, you've got a, a a pair with you or a set with you? Yeah, I've got the set with me. Now this is interesting because I I wonder how many people are like me and have a DSLR but don't know a whole lot about it. I didn't even know these, you talk about how there's threads on the inside of these lenses. Uh, our last episode, we talked about eclipse photography and how neither one of us had a solar, solar filter? Yeah, solar filter. Um, that would use the exact same thing. It uses these tiny little threads that you I didn't even know we're there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'll be able to Ooh, show look at that. This is my 35 millimeter lens. Yeah. And just here inside. Ah, oh, you can see it. Yeah, you can see those little, little screw threads, threads inside there. Sure. And all you do, this is what the, the set looks like. And uh, you bought this for me because it was cheap. It was like 25 bucks. And you're like, here oh, you yeah. go. I got you this thing. Look in the mailbox. And it's this little... <laughs> Polaroid, they're still around, mm -hmm. and uh, just folds up, and then there's these set of filters in there. Check that out. All they Pretty do, awesome. each one is just a higher magnification, basically. You just. Ooh, Phil's, he's, for listeners, he's literally taking this, this thing and screwing it into his lens. I'm trying to get more people to watch our videos. <laughs> <laughs> so you just, you just screw that in there like that? Phil, you came to class prepared. That's awesome. Look at that. It took about four seconds for you to do that. 
and that's it. Now I've got this. This is a plus four, and you're going to have to explain what that means because I don't understand. Okay. And that will get me some very, very nice close-up shots like this one that I'll show yeah. here real quick. And then uh, I'll, have, I'll see if you can talk about what those mean a little bit. Okay. And every see. lens has those threads. So if you just have a regular kit lens for your camera, you've got those threads. Whoa, Phil. It's my little buddy. Uh, I call him Mr. Wasp. Holy he, didn't last, he didn't last very long after this. But what we've got here is a wasp uh, sitting on the beginnings of a nest, those those honeycomb looking things. Phil, and that is was, awesome. Thank you. I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm not just saying that. That's really good. Thank you. And this was just out in the backyard. I mean, it's just you know, this, he was building this nest on the side of the house and I am like our dad in that I see something like this and there are two thoughts that happen. The first one, go get the camera. The second one, <laughs> go get the raid. <laughs> so I go get the camera. I get up super close. I take a couple of shots and then of course I do away with it. Right. For your first instinct is to get the camera, not get yes. these wasps away from your family, but take a exactly. picture of it. Sure. Why yeah. not? Phil, this is incredible. And that's the kind of picture that you would see on the, a cover story of national geographic about wasps. And it's it, that looked sharp And that, that wasp, if you can picture um, that wasp, was basically life size. Um, if you could put that wasp on your camera sensor, it would probably fill the sensor because of how close you got. Yeah, I would have been just, I don't know, an inch, mm -hmm. inch or two away from it. And I knew it wasn't going to bother me because it was busy working on its nest or whatever that thing was. And you and don't so need, just... you didn't use a, a thousand dollar lens. You just used a, an eight dollar little thing that you screwed on top of your camera lens. Yeah. That's awesome, Phil. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and that was a plus four filter? I think that was a plus four filter. Okay, so let me talk about what that means here just uh, before we go on. So um, macro, well, all lenses, camera lenses have a minimum focusing distance. So that is the distance at which it can't focus any closer because of the physics of how your camera lens bends light to focus it. If you get too close to something, your camera simply can't bend the light to make it in focus. And most people that for, for most situations, that's perfectly fine. Can but, I pause you for one quick second? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm going to bring up my, uh, my lens here again. Okay. Um, if you're, if you're just listening to the show, Mm -hmm. and you have your camera near you or the next time you think about it or lens, go look at it and somewhere on it, it will have that focal distance printed on there almost certainly. So here, this is my, uh, my 35 millimeter prime lens mm -hmm. and. Oh, yes. Look at that. It to... says focuses okay. from infinity to 0 0.3 meters. That's exactly right. It focuses to about a foot. That's awesome. Yeah. So this lens, you know, goes about a foot is the closest that it will be able to focus, I'll say naturally. Uh, and you know because what? Hold that lens physically up. physically capable of, you want to see that again? Yeah, because there's another number on there. Okay, there's a number. Um, it says um, Nikon lens. It says the focusing distance, but then it has a zero with a slash through it and 52. That's a Greek number. What is that? Um, rho? Theta, I don't know. what uh, is that? It's zero so, slash. Let me see if I can. Yeah, so is that is the filter thread size. So for your lens, it oh, requires. Oh, that's the Greek letter filter. <laughs> sure. <laughs> if if listeners at home want to know, want to get a set of close up filters for their lens, look on your lens and it will say the thread size. It's got a circle with a slash through it, which is a Greek letter that I should have, I should have come to class prepared with that. And a number. In your case, it was that that Greek letter, and then fifty-two. And most lenses are going to be fifty-two or fifty-eight millimeters. So when you go to B and H Photo or Amazon, just type in fifty-two millimeter close-up filter or fifty-eight millimeter close-up filter, and that's the size of the thread. It's the diameter of the thread on your on your lens. So that's how you know. That's how you know what kind of filters your lens needs. 
um, the plus one, plus two, plus four, that is how close it can focus in addition to what it already can. So if it's a, if your, if your camera focuses at, um, let's put this in terms of meters, let's say it focuses at 10 centimeters or closer. If you put the plus 10 filter on, it will be able to focus at one centimeter. So the, really, sorry, really close. The plus 10 on or the plus one? Plus 10. If you put okay. the plus one filter plus on, it won't, it won't do much of anything at all. Right. Um, the one that I use, uh, oh, and, and I should mention, this is also a drawback of close-up filters. If you get a macro lens off the shelf, you can focus really, really close, but you can also focus really, really far. You can use that lens for anything. A close-up filter will let you pretty much only focus at that distance. So you got that plus four filter on, you can take those amazing shots of something that's really close, but you can't spin around and take a picture of your kid without removing that thread, that, that filter from the threads, because it will only let you focus at a very close distance, not any closer or farther. And it can be really tricky to nail that focus. But once you do, oh man, <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> yeah, I've had that, I've had the problem where I've been out in the backyard taking photos with a plus filter on there and then I forget it's there and want to go take a picture of something that is only going to happen for a moment mm -hmm. of the kids doing something and I miss it because I've still got the filter on there so that's you know that's a drawback to those for sure is that they're only good for that one specific yeah. purpose so and there's there's other ways too if you want to get into macro photography if you have a DSLR close-up filters are the best way in my opinion um, you can also look online for what's called extension tubes. And that is just a, a ring that you attach onto your camera and it's maybe um, three quarters of an inch thick. And then you attach your lens into that ring. It What it does is it, it takes the camera lens and moves it out away from the camera body. And that allows it to focus much, much closer because of the physics of how the lens bends light. If you move the lens farther away from the camera, it will focus closer. Now these extension tubes are, they're not, they're not expensive, but you lose autofocus unless you spend a lot of money on some fancy extension tubes, in which case you might as well just buy a macro lens. But if you, if you use extension tubes, um, you, you, you kind of get the, the benefits of a macro lens because you can co focus close and far but you lose that autofocus. So I don't like extension tubes as much and you have to remove the lens, put on the tube, put the lens back on. It's a lot more moving parts. So I don't, I don't really recommend that, but you can also, believe it or not, get something called a lens reversal ring. <laughs> I'm just so confused right now. I don't it's know another, what it <laughs> It's another way to get into macro photography. It, it uses those filters. It's basically an adapter for those threaded filters on your lens. Uh -huh. And you screw this adapter into those filters and then you can literally flip your lens around and attach your lens backwards onto your camera. When you do that, <laughs> it, it, it because of how the lens bends light, if you flip it around, it will let you focus really close. And a lot of people use these lens reversal rings. So, so I'm just, it's really I'm, weird. I'm a, I, yeah. I got nothing. This is so weird. I had no this idea. Is, <laughs> macro, if you want to get involved in macro photography, my, my recommendation every time is get a set of close-up filters, but there are these other options and some people prefer these other options. And of course there's always a dedicated macro lens, which is probably the best option, but, um, those are a little more expensive, although not that expensive. If you want, if you, if you shoot Nikon, I wrote it down here. You can get a 40 millimeter macro lens. You Phil, you shoot with a 35 millimeter quite often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can get a 40 millimeter macro lens. I think it's F2 weight. So it's got its massive aperture, $275. It's not that much. I mean, no, that's not, that's not thousand dollar territory by any means. I mean, right. the, the prime lens itself is about $200. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're, 
if you're able, if you're in the market for that kind of thing and able to spend a couple hundred bucks on it, that's the way to go for sure. But if you just want to try this and just kind of see what you can do, get a set of close up filters. Yeah, for sure. I, mean, I wish I would have known about these things years ago. Me too. <laughs> I and it's hard, it's hard because when I read this is where um, online can be a detriment. So I read a lot of things online about extension tubes and all this stuff. And a lot of people were saying that close-up filters aren't good because you lose sharpness. Well, if you read enough photography forums and blogs, you'll find people complaining about things like noise at ISO 6400 and a loss of sharpness if you use macro, uh, if you use uh, these close-up filters. And it doesn't mean anything to, to regular people. It might mean something to people who are people who are, are zooming in as far as they can go in every single photo and looking for things to criticize. But that photo you put up of that wasp, my goodness, that that is, as far as I can tell, completely tack sharp, wall size print worthy. And it wasn't taken with a fancy lens, basic lens and a super cheap adapter that you just yeah. popped on the front. So um, it's, that, that's why- I have a lot to get into this. No, 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 no. You don't even need a new DSLR. You can do this with, you can go on eBay, find a DSLR for 150 bucks, a kit lens, a set of close-up filters, and you're good to go. And it's a great way to get involved in macro photography. We, um, we are running a little close on time. Oh, are we? Okay. I've got, I've got uh, man, I have I have several more that I pulled go, up. Yeah, yeah, go, go. I, I'm not even looking at the clock. I'm having so much fun here. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Uh, let's see. This one, I'm not even going to say what it is. I just, I want you to, to tell me what you what guess you the photo. And I'm pretty sure this was taken with a close-up filter. If not, then I'm just really that good. <laughs> Cause I, it's, it had to be taken with a close-up filter. Okay. There's just no way to know because it doesn't, there's no way to, the camera has no idea that the filter's attached. Yeah, so you don't point. get that in the, mm -hmm. in the metadata. Okay. Holy cow, Bill. So for, for the kids at home, can you tell them what this is? It's, to me, it looks like a 4th of July sparkler. And I don't know how close you got, but I'd be worried about my camera getting going up in flames here because this is really close. And man, you see these sparks flying everywhere. This is cool, Phil. Thank you. Th this is one of my favorites. And, yeah, uh, it's, I can see why I've talked about on the show before, how you got to be willing that you don't have to be, but you, it's sometimes it's about just being willing to put yourself in a different position or different perspective. Well, I'm, I'm willing to take my camera and get probably too close to something like a sparkler or a firework or a match, whatever, to try to get this picture. Cause I really want to see what it looks like. Phil, I, and, you need to go. I'm giving you an assignment. I want I want you to upload that to Walgreens, get an eight by ten of it, and put that on your wall behind you. It be uh -huh. it, it costs like a dollar fifty to get it, that printed at Walgreens. You don't even need a frame. That is such a, a good photo. That needs to be up on a wall somewhere. All right, I'll do that. Do it. I have one more, and this one goes back to uh, the dad part of camera dads. Mm -hmm. There is. There's a version of this picture that I'm going to show that I wanted to take around Christmas time, and I was never able to get it. Um, mm. It's yeah. I think you've told me about this photo that you've tried to get before. This is my daughter's eye, and it is so so close that you can. This is like CSI enhanced. Yes, yeah, that is really close. If I if I stared at this long enough, I could probably figure out where that was taken because I can see things in the reflection in her eye that I could probably use to figure out what room I was in. <laughs> Man, Phil. Yeah, you can and, see the the ceiling lights. You can see outside in the window. You can see stuff on the wall all reflected in her eye. You took that with with a a 
twenty dollar uh, filter with um, probably. Let me see if I can. I took this with. Oh goodness, not even. Yeah. It was, yeah. This was a Nikon Coolpix P one hundred. Come on, seriously? Yeah. What? <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm not I'm not faking yeah. here. A Nikon Coolpix P one hundred. This is the details. I'm showing. Um, this is for for the video. This was uh, taken in 2012 yeah. before I had a DSLR. Uh, goodness. <laughs> it's all of three megapixels. <laughs> And a P100 so is, is sort of, it's one of those like intermediate cameras, right? Where it's not yeah. a super pocket camera, but it's not a, a an actual DSLR. You can't remove the lens. Yeah, it's got the handle. That's your camera that, DSLR. yeah, yeah. And you could zoom, right? Yeah, that had like a 24X optical zoom or something. Yeah. It's sort of my default. Um, That's kind of right. Thing for a while. But there's a version of this picture that I want to take around Christmas time. And that picture is... A child's eyeball from the side mm -hmm. looking at the Christmas tree and reflected in their eye is all the Christmas lights from the tree mm -hmm. and maybe a, a couple of ornaments or something. So you're going to have their eyelashes. If you watch the video, I'm kind of trying to act this out with my hands, but you've got those like making duck quacking sounds. <laughs> you've got the, yes. the eyelashes over here, but it's everything's tack sharp and you can see that it's your child's eyes and they're just completely engrossed in the Christmas tree. But at mm -hmm. the same time, you can see the Christmas tree. You can see the lights, you can see the ornaments, but it's sure. all in their eye. That, I want to get that's that a photo that I want to get. Yes. I, I want to get that photo. Yet. That's, oh man, now I, I want to try the sparkler photo. I want to try the Christmas tree reflected in the eye photo. I want to do these now that you mention it. And <laughs> There's a lot more. There's a whole lot more that I, oh, uh, yeah. that I like. And it's just, just uh, I don't know. It's well, just a it, hobby and it's a lot of fun. Let me share one thing um, because I was going to mention something to, uh, to readers out there as kind of a cautionary tale. I'm going to share my screen and see if I can get my, uh, I'm going to share my, my Lightroom here. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So for those of you, well, Phil, why don't you describe what this is? Okay. I I can't, I got to pin it here. There it goes. Um, I know exactly what this is. This is a pocket watch that you gave your groomsman at your wedding. How would you know that? I have one. <laughs> what? Were you, I have one of these. You were uh, my groomsman? I must have been. What was it? Yeah, or I swiped it from someone else. So it's a, it's a pocket watch. It's kind of a gold and silver colored. The lighting makes it look like it's sitting on, I don't know, like a dark table with a lamp above it. And the inside of the watch is, is kind of glowing a little bit. It's mm -hmm. golds and silver colors. It's just a like this photo would be on the storefront of a watch repair shop. Well, thank you, Phil. <laughs> that's that's where I see something like this. And so, yeah, that, that's a great photo. That's a well, great photo. Thank you. Um, the reason I point out this out is a couple of things. First of all, this is one of the very first pictures I took when I got my close-up filters, and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I just started going around taking pictures of everyday objects. And I pulled this watch out of my drawer and took a picture of it. But there's also a couple of things I want to point out. Um, the aperture on my lens, well, if you look at this, the depth of field is so, so shallow. The, the F in fossil is out of focus, and the L in fossil is a little out of focus. So the depth of field is a matter of millimeters here. It's probably an eighth of an inch in this photo is in focus. So it's, it is so shallow, the depth of field. And that's one of the nice things about working with with uh, close-up filters or macro photography. You get these razor thin um, planes of focus. But if I look at the data for this, the aperture on my lens was was not very big. It was actually f eleven. Wow. If you if you've ever shot um, with wider apertures, generally you know that a, a wider aperture like f one eight, f two eight, f four will give you a shorter, a smaller depth of field. 
Well, this was shot at f11, which is a really, really tiny aperture, but got even so a super, super small depth of field. That's because I was shooting this with my plus 10 close up filter. And when you're shooting so close with such thin depth of field, there's almost no margin of error. You, you have to nail focus. So this was one of probably 20 pictures I took to get it to look just right. And sometimes I even use manual focus to try and get the, photo, the focus just right. And this is also ISO 6400 and um, my, okay, so it was my full frame, my D750. But even at ISO 6400, this is one of those examples where um, I talk about how people on the internet might complain, of, oh, it's not sharp and it's not, um, it's noisy in the corners and stuff like that. But don't listen to that. If you want to explore something and push the limits of your camera, do it. Don't listen to what internet commenters like two dads on a podcast yeah. <laughs> have to say. Just try it and go for it. Um, so I, I just want to share that as a, j just an example. But as you said, we're running low on time here. Anything else to say about all this macro stuff? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I think uh, I'd say if you're interested in it, try it. Get an auto clip for your phone or get a set of these close-up filters on Amazon and just try it and see what you get, you know, see what your results are. And if you have some luck and you like what you see, keep going and send us those pictures. We'd love to see anything that, that the listeners are able to, to do with this macro thing. And for oh, me, yeah. it's, just, it's, it's always been, it's always been a photographic hobby and it, it always will be. I'm going to um, keep doing it. And listeners, if you want to post pictures to our Facebook page, I believe we have sharing enabled, so you, so listeners can post to our page. If not, I don't know. We'll try and do that. Yeah. Um, good. Now, before we end, there's uh, a, we actually had a, a question from someone from two months ago. I'm so sorry it's taken so long to get to this. Um, Susan left a comment on our website. She said, during episode seven, you mentioned the difference in the quantity of photos you've taken years ago when people use film cameras and how that compares to today's massive amounts of digital photos. Susan says, my question is this, were the photo techniques used with film cameras very different than the techniques used with today's digital cameras? Um, I've got an answer to that. Phil, do you want to answer that? I don't really have an answer to that. I, okay. No, okay. I'm not, I didn't really, I had one film camera and I didn't know what I was doing with it ever. So same, same with me. Um, so the answer to, uh, to your question, Susan, uh, the basic techniques haven't changed at all. They're the same today as they were 100 years ago. Um, the the exposure triangle, which means the the aperture of your lens, the shutter speed, and the film sensitivity, or what you now call ISO, those three have always been a part of photography, and that's what's always been used. Um, photography today is about composing your shot. It's about light. It's about focusing. Um, it's about uh, having a vision of what you want to photograph and doing it, those basic techniques have not changed ever. And they likely will not change, even with all the new technologies coming out today. It's always going to be about capturing light and the the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Um, digital cameras make photography easier, but the fundamentals are still the same. So Susan, I hope that helps. I'm so sorry it's late. And uh, keep the questions coming. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for getting around. Uh, thanks for taking care of that. No problem. We've had that one started for a while. So, um, Phil, right. what are we talking about next? Oh, uh, gosh, I don't even know. I honestly forgot. So I was hoping you could tell okay. me. I will tell you next week, we're going to talk to uh, talk about something that I actually alluded to uh, earlier in the episode, which is making prints of your photos. And that's something that, uh, Phil, I know you do a lot. And this is going to talk, we're going to cover everything from one-off prints, like going to Walgreens, getting an eight by 10 or four by six made to printing larger amounts of photos to printing uh, photo books. So we're gonna talk about when we print photos, what our process is, because there's it's not as easy to print a photo as it is to just put it on your Instagram. We're gonna talk about why we print photos and, and maybe why we don't and anything involving printing photos. So if, listeners, if you have anything to share about printing photos, let us know and We'll use it as feedback for next episode. Sounds great. Sounds great. I'm excited. I am too. It's going to be a good one. 
Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you, Simon. This has been a lot of fun. I agree, Phil. This is a great time. Yeah. Cool. Me too. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for hanging around, and we will catch you next time. Have a good night. Good night.